Good afternoon, everyone. I am Eric Lufer, the president of the Citizens Research Council of Michigan. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Citizens Research Council's webinar, Analyzing Governor Whitmer's 2023 Budget Proposals. Next slide, please. This webinar is being presented by the Citizens Research Council of Michigan in Mears. The Citizens Research Council is a statewide nonpartisan public affairs research group. This is the Citizens Research Council's 106th year of operation. On longevity, we attribute to our promotion of sound public policy for state and local governments through accurate, independent, and objective research. We are a private not-for-profit organization, and we rely on the charitable contributions of foundations, businesses, corporations, and individuals. I'd like to encourage all of you to join our circle of supporters and help us to continue to provide high quality independent information on important policy topics in Michigan. If you value how this webinar and the associated uh, work we do contribute to the public discourse and hope to keep the Citizens Research Council as an objective, independent, credible source of information into the next century, please consider a contribution. As many of you, I hope, know, Mears is a daily outlet that covers state government and politics in Michigan. John Ruhrink and Carl Mellon will join us later for the question and answer section of the presentation. The handout slide with the uh, handout file with the slides is on the event page for this webinar if you want to follow along. Please note we are recording this webinar and we'll post it on our web page where it will be available for future viewing. It usually takes about an hour after end of the presentation for everything to process. Also, we have everyone but the presenters on mute, so we will not be able to hear you if you speak. We have received a few questions as part of the registration process, and I will try to relate others to John and Kyle as we go, um, but know that if you ask any questions, we will get back to you, follow the webinar, uh, make sure you get the information you're looking for. If anything requires clarification, you can use the question pane as well. If you have any technical problems during the webinar, please let me know by calling 734-542-8001. After the webinar, you will re be receiving an email soliciting your feedback, and we would very much appreciate anything you uh, can contribute. The webinar continues the Citizens Research Council's long history of analyzing the financial condition of the state and reviewing the governor's executive budgets. Our analysis of the budgets is not done in the context of whether the state is dedicating sufficient resources to specific functions, but to better understand how resources are being allocated and consider the sustainability of the state's finances. We thank the Michigan Association of Counties for their support in bringing you this webinar. Next slide. We have been doing these budget analysis uh, going back 20 some years now. Uh, and most of those were couched in a, in a context of scarce resources. So it's kind of unusual for us to get together today to talk about an abundance of resources. To do that, we have two presenters. Bob Schneider is our senior research associate focused on state affairs. He has a long history with the state budget office and the House Fiscal Agency, and is one of the premier scholars in the state uh, following uh, this information, and we're lucky to have him. Next slide. Uh, Craig Thiel is our research director and the senior research associate assigned to education finance. Before coming to the Citizens Research Council, Craig worked for the Senate Fiscal Agency and House Fiscal Agency. And previous to this time, he held positions with the Department of State and the United States Environmental Protection Agency in Chicago. Next slide. Uh, I encourage everyone to visit our website where you can download our papers and follow our blog. We have an email notification system that lets you know when new papers are posted and keeps you up to date with Friday uh, newsletters. You can join that very easily by texting Facts Matter. You can see that in the bottom right corner of the slide. Facts Matter to 42828. 
with that, I will turn this over to Bob and uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks, uh, thanks much, Eric. Can everyone hear me? Hopefully I unmuted myself effectively. Uh, thank you, Eric, and good afternoon to, uh, to everyone. Uh, actually, good morning still. I appreciate you all joining us for today's web uh, webinar. Um, we, we're going to break this out into parts, and what we're going to start out with is a review of the state's revenue picture and how we find ourselves, as Eric just alluded to, with um, some of the largest revenue surpluses that I can certainly recall during my uh, you know, 30 years or so working on, uh, on state budgets. Uh, in the budget office and the legislature. Um, and then we're gonna close with a short history before we move to the budget, uh, you know, a, a historical perspective on our on our general fund revenue picture. So let, let's start by reviewing the state, uh, the, the January consensus revenue estimating conference forecasts and, and what they mean for available resources that the governor was looking to tap into uh, in her and available to her in her uh, budget recommendation. So just quick background, state economists meet twice a year, January and May. Their formal forecast set the set a uh, you know guidepost for revenue available to budget writers, um, you know the the uh, the executive budget recommendation and the final enacted budget. On the general fund side, this January revenue uh, revenue projections continue to boom. So across fiscal year 21, 22, 23, this slide shows a combined revenue adjustment of 3.1 billion dollars. Um, in the general fund, it, it, I, I kind of would look at that in two ways. We have a 22 budget already in place. So the 1.7 billion from fiscal year 21 and that $770 million in, in fiscal year, the upward adjustment for fiscal year 22, gets kind of one-time revenue. You know, you can add to, uh, to a, a current year supplemental, or if not, th this revenue is all gonna carry forward to fiscal year 23 and, and be available in 23, but we need to look for one-time purposes to, to spend those one-time resources. The, the $621 million for, uh, for the, the upgrade for fiscal year 23 revenue is really that um, addition to uh, available ongoing budget resources that would support sort of permanent adjustments in the budget. If we look at the same forecast adjustments for the school aid fund, we, we see pretty much the same story. Big upward adjustments across the three fiscal years. Um, again, I, I characterize this as sort of $1.9 billion in new one-time revenue from 21 and 22 that that uh, would be available, you know, by likely to fall into the uh, amount carried forward into 23, and then that uh, that 23 adjustment of 819 million dollars again uh, adds to sort of the permanently available revenue that would support ongoing budget investments uh, to the extent that the governor or legislature deem them uh, deem them to be wise. So. Those revenue for forecasts from January really capped off a crazy year uh, for uh, for those revenue forecasters that participate in the revenue estimating conference, some of whom are good friends of mine, and I know them as very smart people. Um, but uh, the, the changes in um, in the revenue forecast really uh, really kept them running all year. Um, this slide outlines the progression of general fund and school aid fund forecasts for fiscal year 22, um, starting with January 2020 and that very first blue bar um, before COVID, uh, and then moving through the next five consensus uh, forecasts um, through the last one in January of 2022. So note two things. When COVID struck in early 2020, um, revenue forecast plummeted, both school aid and general fund, um, a combined uh, $2.1 billion across both those funds. Um, it, it, and that's when you know things looked very bleak. After that, forecasts slowly improved and, and by the kind of gold bar for January 2022, not only have we gained back uh, and gotten back to the pre-COVID revenue projections, but we're actually $2.4 billion above those projections. We've seen remarkable uh, revenue uh, revenue uh, increases. So in, in, as we're gonna see momentarily, that, that has given us a lot, of, a, a very large fund balance to carry forward in both the general fund and the school aid fund. How did we get there? Well, we did a lot of budget cutting and fund shifting in 2020, uh, in 2021 for a revenue downturn that we thought was going to happen, but that never really came to be. And then on top of that, not only did revenues come back to the, the levels that we 
saw them at in January of 2020, but they've boomed, they boomed much, much further. And let's, we're going to take a couple slides to look at why, uh, a couple factors that drive why those revenues have been so strong um, and so much stronger than we initially projected. So first, let's look at Michigan employment. Um, from March, uh, you, you see that just pre precipitous drop. From March of 2020 to April of 2020, Michigan shed over 1.2 um, million jobs in the state. That was about 25% of, of all of our employment. That's really bad news. Um, and, and in that, uh, in that initial forecast, uh, by, by the revenue estimators that, that, that had that huge decline, that's what they were seeing at the time. But what happened is we, we really had a pretty quick recovery. Um, employment came back rather quickly, um, quicker than I think those initial forecasts projected. So that helped. But you also see we're still down. We're, we're still down significantly. Um, we've only recovered about 80% of the, the employment losses that we experienced early in, in COVID. And employment is growing pretty slowly. So we're probably not going to get back to pre-COVID levels for, for quite some time. So employment, the, the, the employment recovery explains some of it. Um, this second slide, I think, project, uh, it helps explain a lot more of it. So um, this is Michigan personal income, quarterly personal income, and it's broken out into three key components. Um, the, the blue section is net earnings, what we earn from our jobs and you know business income and so forth. Uh, orange bar, orange section, dividends, interest, rent, and then the gray bar, transfer payments. So for in 2018, 2019, and in prior years, those transfer payments are, are mainly social security, um, unemployment insurance benefits, regular unemployment insurance benefits uh, that, that folks receive. What happened, look look to quarter 2020 quarter two, you see that gray bar just boom. So while we lost net earnings, which we would of course do when we lose tremendous amounts of employment, though those gray bars, that those transfer payments just boom. And, and why did they boom? Um, what's driving that? economic impact, tax refunds that we all received, uh, enhanced unemployment insurance benefits and the unemployment bonus that was available to, uh, to, to unemployed workers at that time, um, federal stimulus like the Paycheck Protection Program, all of that's counted in that gray area. And you see, you know, kind of extremely high uh, growth in those transfer payments. So that in 2020, we actually had one of the best years ever in, in personal income growth in Michigan. So, uh, you know, why, why did we see um, such robust um, uh, uh, revenue growth? And, and why are we sitting on these big balances? Uh, you know, we, 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 we cut budgets. Uh, for revenue, uh, for revenue declines that, that didn't really happen, uh, and uh, and now we're you know the, that extra federal stimulus really drove a lot of extra income, which drove extra sales tax and income tax revenue growth, and it leaves us with this now. We we have very large general fund and school aid fund surpluses um, that based on current appropriations, this doesn't factor in yet any of the governor's budget recommendations, we expect to have close to $7 billion uh, carried into, uh, into 2023. Again, we talked about most of that's kind of one-time revenue um, and you'd need to look for one-time spending needs to, to, to utilize that revenue. But um, after the January forecast, as we looked at kind of long-term sustainability, it looked to us like there was probably room for about a billion dollars in, in ongoing permanent growth in uh, general fund investments and probably about another 1.3 billion for the school aid fund. So as the governor introduced her budget, as the legislature now looks at the budget, um, there is a lot of ongoing revenue available for new investments, or uh, of course uh, you can use ongoing revenue for both spending increases or tax relief, you know, giving it back to the taxpayers. And, and certainly that was on the table uh, uh, for the governor and, and the legislature will be considering the same, which we'll talk about more as we as we move along. Before we get to the spending side, I did want to do a quick, um, a, a quick history lesson, uh, particularly on the general fund. Let's not forget, um, not too long ago, uh, we, you know, the state just climbed out of about a 20-year a hole on the general fund side 
uh, of the revenue picture. This slide um, shows actual general fund revenue on the top line and then inflation adjust, uh, adjusted general fund revenue on the bottom line. Um, but the first decade of the new century was not a good one for Michigan. We saw persistent employment losses during the 20, 2000 to 2010 period. Um, we saw stagnating income during that period. We also saw some various tax policy changes that, that contributed to a pretty dramatic drop in general fund revenue in actual dollars from 10 10.7 billion to 7.7 billion by by 2010. That's a really sharp drop, um, and, and even on an inflation-adjusted basis, we've seen lots of growth since 2010. But uh, as we, you know, even if these these uh, healthy the, the the forecasted healthy revenue growth comes to fruition, uh, you know, by 2024 with that growth, we will still be down about 20 22 percent. Um, in inflation-adjusted GFGP revenue from where we were uh, in, in uh, you know, 20, 22 years ago in, in fiscal year 2000. And, and that, of course, had um, significant, uh, significant impacts on the state budget. We're going to see some of those areas that were, that were cut uh, um, later as we go through some of the proposals that the governor has advanced for uh, ongoing spending increases. But um, remember, as good as the times are right now, that was not always the case. And on the general fund side, we are um, just uh, just kind of climbing out of a, a hole that had existed for some time. So let's turn to the governor's fiscal year 23 budget proposals. And, and before getting into the spending proposals, I thought we'd start by talking about the two major tax proposals um, that are part of her recommendation. Um, remember, we just talked about on the general fund side, we, we probably have room for about a billion dollars in, uh, you know, in a, in a permanent new allocation of general fund revenue. As we'll see here, the governor's chosen to allocate a lot of that revenue um, to, to tax relief. And the governor's recommendation is basically to repeal two major tax policy changes that were implemented in 2011 um, as part of what at that time was a major restructuring of business taxation that saw uh, the repeal of the Michigan business tax um, and its replacement with, the, uh, with, the, with a new corporate income tax. Uh, as part of that, um, the, the, uh, the uh, legislature and, and uh, Governor Snyder at the time um, approved two other tax policy changes to try to shore up revenues to kind of offset some of the revenue losses that the business restructure tax restructuring would bring around uh, bring about one tax policy change that was implemented at that time um, to help offset the revenue reductions was a, a reduction in the state's earned income tax credit um, and the governor is proposing to um, basically undo that that change before before 2011 the, uh, the, the earned income tax credit available to low income uh, working households with er earned income was, uh, was pegged at 20% of the existing federal credit. Uh, the 2011 tax policy changes reduced the credit to 6% of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of that credit. Um, the governor's proposal would return the EITC to, uh, to, the, to that 20% threshold, that is expected to um, increase uh, increase available um, uh, credits by about 300 to $450, according to state budget office estimates, to those that are eligible, which is almost uh, 700, about 738,000 uh, households that, that currently get that credit. That brings, um, uh, None of that. Uh, none of that impacts uh, fiscal year 22, um, but the fiscal year 23 revenue impact for that change would be uh, a foregone revenue of about 262 million dollars. That would continue to grow a little bit over time. Um, the the next uh, the next piece of her tax proposals is uh, the elimination of. Uh, changes in the treatment of retirement ta uh, retirement income under the income tax that were put in place as well as a, as a revenue enhancement um, during the business tax restructuring uh, uh, legislation that was enacted in 2011. So let me try my best to quickly summarize what what that what happened in 2011 and um, and how things will, uh, will will change under the governor's proposal. So in 20 uh, before 2011 public pension income and that uh, was exempted from the income tax and for private pension income there was a fairly generous exemption of uh, 
uh, of that uh, retirement income. Uh, in 2011, the law was changed to say no more, basically no more exemption of uh, public and private uh, uh, pension and retirement income until folks um, reach the age of 67. And at that point, um, there would be a, a special $20,000 exemption for single filers, $40,000 exemption for joint filers against all income, earned income, retirement income, all types of income. Um, the governor's proposal is basically to to go back to, to to repeal those changes and go back um, to the old rules and to and, and to phase that uh, that transition in over time by the percentage of retirement income exempted and by age and I and I sort of map out um, the uh, that that phase in in uh, in tax year 2022. Um, the changes would apply to those 60, 65 or older, and 25% of, of retirement income would be exempted until uh, that gradually phases up by, by tax year 2025. Um, everyone who has retirement income um, can go back and basically operate under the old, uh, under the old exemption rules. The, it, another piece of the governor's proposal is for those who... Um, who benefit under the new rules, which would, I, as I thought about it, would include, I, I think, I think the target here is like working, older working, um, uh, you know, a 68 year old who's working and, and may, uh, you know, may, may be earning, uh, have earned income where the, the $20,000, $40,000 exemption for all income is, is advantageous, they'll be able to do that. So it won't, uh, the, you know, I think the governor's goal was to prevent any, anybody from getting a tax increase under these changes. Um, this this is a big ticket item. It phases in through um, 2025, um, and, and uh, you know we, we see there you know significantly growing foregone revenue uh, uh, you know from 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 that change. So aggregated together, what does this mean um, for general fund uh, for general fund uh, revenue growth over time over that time period? Um, so the, the two tax proposals, we, we have general fund uh, revenue for FY22, big arrow there at $12.4 billion. Without these proposals, uh, the, 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 the consensus revenue forecast project a general fund revenue to grow 13.7 billion by 2025. These proposals basically eat up about 60, almost two thirds, 63% of that projected GF revenue growth between 2022 and 2025. So a, a pretty big piece of that. Um, we we forego a significant amount of our uh, of our GF revenue growth. What's that mean for um, the budget? Uh, Remember, we talked about uh, there being about, on our estimates, about a billion dollars available for sort of ongoing revenue growth. That th those those tax those tax revisions that the governor's proposed start to eat into that um, slowly over time. So that by 2025, you know, we only have about 233 million dollars remaining for ongoing investments plus whatever extra growth. Um, uh, 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 occurred, you know, beyond uh, beyond the 2020 uh, 2022 um, uh, level. So that that really means we probably only have room for 350 with the tax proposals from the governor, be 350 400 million dollars in room for for permanent growth now, um, uh, long term. All right, so. With that, we uh, let, let's take let's take a, a quick look at a, a high level summary of of what the governor proposed on the spending side. We see um, uh, we we see the governor's 2023 budget recommendation on the whole in terms of total appropriations reaches 74 billion dollars. Um, that's a 2.6 percent increase. That's significantly greater than than the. Uh, uh, the uh, enacted budgets in, in terms of gross appropriations from you know four or five years ago, uh, lots of federal revenue um, still still built into this base um, from uh, from support from the federal government. This year, though, we see really strong, uh, really strong growth in both given those revenue estimates that we just talked about. Really strong growth in both general fund general purpose appropriations up, you know, over 10 percent, and in the school aid side. Uh, growth of about 6.7%. What, 
what what if we, if we want to look at that growth um, and and look at uh, you know, is it one time? Is it ongoing? Uh, this this kind of dives into the detail of characterizing the growth for both the general fund and the school aid fund. Um, so when we look at that big growth in general fund, most of that, about two four two point four billion dollars, is one time. And I'll be running through some of the big pieces of that later in the presentation. Um, it left room for just over four hundred million dollars in ongoing and. Uh, um, uh, investments and then uh, 500 million dollars in in sort of baseline cost growth, uh, Medicaid and human services caseloads, state employee payroll, um, other financing uh, impacts uh, for the general fund or I'm sorry for the school aid fund, much more ongoing revenue that uh, uh, my colleague Craig Thiel is is going to start to review in just a moment. Um, uh, you know, still some still some one time investments in 23 for the for the school aid fund, but um, uh, a lot more room for for ongoing uh, investments that the that the governor used on on the school aid fund side. All right, so now we're going to look at the specifics of the governor's budget recommendation, um, and I am going to turn uh, the microphone over. Uh, to my colleague, um, Citizens Research Council Research Director, Craig Thiel, who's gonna run through some of the education highlights. So Craig, uh, on over to you, and I'm gonna make sure I mute myself here. Craig, we can't hear you. You you might need to unmute him, uh, Eric. Or I can give you my headset. Excuse us as we work out our technical difficulties here. There we go. Thanks. Yeah, so Eric did a, or Bob did an excellent job of, of setting the stage uh, for the governor's proposal. I'm gonna address the uh, education funding uh, items in the proposal. Uh, the pro proposal comes forward in, in two pieces. There's the supplemental proposal as well as the, uh, the uh, fiscal 23 uh, recommendation. So beginning with that large surplus of school aid fund, that's about 3.6 billion we talked about. The chart here shows how the governor wants to, to spend that money. Um, a heavy focus on addressing uh, uh, workforce issues that local school districts are currently grappling with. Um, about 50% of the uh, resources are dedicated to employee retention programs. Um, another third of the uh, are roughly uh, 500 million would go towards uh, teacher recruitment. Um, and then about a billion dollars to a new school infrastructure uh, deposit that'll get spent over a period of uh, six years with the first appropriation coming in FY23. I would note that the uh, uh, school uh, workforce funding that's recommended here would also be spent over a number of years. Uh, the retention bonuses would be a uh, uh, spread out over a four year period. Uh, a number of the uh, teacher recruitment programs have a uh, two year and in some cases five year spend down. So while the money would be appropriated in the fiscal 22 uh, budget supplemental, uh, the uh, Craig, you got muted. All right. There we go. I'm back at the governor's proposal for uh, overall budgets here. And uh, uh, again, this is 
just looking at the school aid fund pieces of the uh, K through 12 budget, as well as the higher ed budgets. Uh, generally, there's a 5% increase across all these education budgets for the foundation or for the K-12 uh, budget, that would be the foundation allowance for the community college and the higher ed pieces, that would be uh, their general operations. Uh, additionally, uh, the governor has recommended um, uh, a use of uh, uh, those one-time resources in the way of another 5% bump for the operations uh, funding of the universities as well as the community colleges. Um, I'd point out that the community colleges funding comes entirely from the school aid fund and that the university's piece is kind of fixed out of that. So those uh, that operating inc operations increase for, for the universities as well as that one time piece will be funded out of the general fund. Um, so all told, uh, looking at this chart on the, uh, the right side of the screen, uh, we can see what's how the uh, school aid fund is, is kind of allocated for the 2023. Uh, budget beginning with the ongoing appropriations for the K through 12 uh, budget, uh, adding uh, an increase in ongoing investments that total about 1.2 billion, one uh, one-time investments of just under 400 million, and some adjustments of of about a, a, a decrease of about 100 million. So overall, the ongoing support for K through 12 uh, budget is is up about 1.3 billion over what's in current law today, that's about an 8% increase. Looking over on the higher ed side, uh, the, the ongoing investment increase here is, is the, uh, the additional 5% for the community colleges, then the one-time uh, investment for the community colleges, again, another 5% increase. And then when you look across all of the higher ed budgets, the uh, increase in school aid appropriations is about 12 uh, a million dollars, uh, just about a 2% uh, increase. So flipping over now to the K-12 budget, um, what we see here is that the overall budget's up substantially from uh, $17 billion uh, currently uh, to 18.4 uh, billion. This is about an 8% overall increase. Again, that's broken out uh, between uh, some one-time spend as well as some ongoing spending. The ongoing spending uh, is about 1.1 uh, billion of this, and that's allocated chiefly among these four items here. Uh, that 5% increase in the foundation allowance is gonna draw down about 50% uh, of that uh, ongoing uh, investment. Uh, another 20% uh, for uh, an increase in the at-risk student funding allocations, and then roughly 13% each uh, for increases to special ed uh, programming, as well as a, a new uh, teacher recruitment program uh, that's implemented in the uh, 2022 budget. Um, and then use of the one-time resources for, uh, to address a, a number of uh, student mental health programs in K through 12 schools. The chart on your right um, provides uh, three years of, uh, of a look at uh, state appropriations for K through 12. Uh, I would note uh, the 2021 uh, bar is substantially uh, uh, increased with the uh, the federal resources uh, that have come to the state. Those dollars were largely appropriated in the 21 budget, but are going to be spent over a number of years going forward. Uh, when we look at uh, the 2022 budget, you can see the the impact of the governor's supplemental appropriation uh, on the blue bar blue portion of the bars uh, in the increase of, of, of roughly uh, $2.2 billion of school aid fund resources over and above what's currently in law. And then when we look over to the 23 budget, what we see is kind of the, the removal of those one-time resources and what are more or less the ongoing uh, spend down for K through 12. So breaking down that, that K-12 budget into some of the bigger pieces, looking at um, the foundation allowance, this is the per pupil grant that uh, districts receive. I'll remind uh, our listeners that last year, um, uh, the budget increased the per pupil grant for, for all of our districts up to uh, and guaranteed though them uh, 
$8,700. Uh, this eliminated that longstanding uh, funding gap between low and high spending districts. Under the governor's proposal, it would would go up by another $435 to just over $9,100. That increase is uh, applied across all districts other than those uh, schools that are providing a 100% online experience. And again, this represents about half of the uh, overall uh, ongoing resource spend that the, the governor's recommending. Uh, I'll note here and the chart on the right shows this, that uh, there is a, a after a, a very sizable decline in uh, the pupil memberships um, in the 2022 budget uh, year, the year we're currently in, there's uh, just a very small, modest uh, uh, decline in, in student membership. Um, so declining enrollment is, is still an issue statewide. Uh, this experience is gonna vary uh, across the state ge geographically. Um, some are gonna see uh, much larger de decreases th than that, and others are gonna see um, increases. I've, I've highlighted the, um, the, the enrollment decline as well as the membership decline, and you can see that um, the uh, actual enrollment decline that occurred uh, because of COVID was in the 2021 school year, but the state budget largely shielded districts from the, the full fiscal effect of that um, uh, and, and delayed that uh, by a year um, by implementing a, a change in uh, how we counted students um, for the current, for uh, I'm sorry, for the 2021 year. Uh, in the current year, we've, we've returned to the, 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 the kind of the regular uh, way of counting students. So that, that decline, that COVID decline really doesn't show up for another year. Um, I'd note that there there are no uh, home hold harmless protections uh, for districts um, from declining enrollment this year. Now, looking uh, that was kind of a picture of what's what's going on with the general operating resources for schools. If we look at student specific spending, uh, the governor's recommending a, a fairly substantial increase in the uh, at risk funding um, uh, law allows for a up to 11.5% uh, uh, weight provided uh, to districts uh, for economically disadvantaged students. Um, today, that's at about $768. That'll increase to uh, over $1,000. So this will provide a, a full statutory funding for at-risk funding uh, for, for districts. And I'd note that about a little over 50% of our, our student population qualifies for this funding. Uh, some districts, um, very high concentration of at-risk students, so that funding uh, will be concentrated primarily in, in those districts that have those students. Um, on the special ed side, there's a 5% increase in the, the cost reimbursement that the state provides to districts by law. Uh, the, the minimum state reimbursement is, is set at 29%. Uh, currently, it is at 32%, um, and the governor has proposed an additional five percentage point increase in the, in the cost reimbursements for special ed programs. Um, for most districts, this funding won't necessarily materialize and increase special ed uh, spending uh, in, in the way of programming or services as much as it will be used to offset um, current general fund contributions that districts make to their special ed programs. Special ed for decades has not been fully funded from dedicated resources and it's required districts to dip into their, their general fund uh, budgets to uh, support that spend. And uh, this increase in state reimbursement will largely go to offset those general fund. Uh, Again, looking at a couple more highlights here in the school aid budget, the school infrastructure uh, grant program that's capitalized in the 2022 budget at roughly at a billion dollars is uh, the first uh, appropriation shows up in the 23 year. Um, this would provide matching grants uh, to uh, schools across the state to, to, to deal with uh, improvements, modernization of their uh, capital facilities. I'd note here that uh, the proposal would exclude charter schools and the students attending those from, from these resources. Uh, the, the teacher recruitment program, again, uh, 
begun in 2022, uh, continued in 23 on an ongoing basis with $150 million to provide tuition reimbursement to uh, students who are going to pursue a, a degree that would put them into uh, public schools of our state uh, after they get done. So this is a way to address uh, the, the current labor challenges in schools. And then the, uh, the one-time funding of roughly $300 million, uh, again, recognizing that not all of the one-time resources uh, from that the school aid surplus aren't spent in the supplemental and are brought forward and, and spent in the 23 fiscal year. The other item of note is that the uh, state-funded preschool program um, currently at $8,700 uh, per slot for a full day would increase uh, by 5%, uh, similar to the foundation grant. So as we take a, a, a little bit of a step back from these funding proposals, I, I wanted to highlight that while the state's adding uh, uh, these funds to K-12 through 12 budgets, um, this 8% uh, overall increase, this is happening, happening against the backdrop of a major uh, infusion of federal resources um, through the relief packages. Uh, the ESSER program, the Elementary Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund is, is the, the largest of this. Uh, Michigan schools have received and will receive uh, 5.7 billion over all three uh, allocations. 90% of that money is going directly to districts um, on a federal formula. The state has stepped in um, to make sure that all districts receive a minimum uh, of uh, $1,100 uh, from the most recent uh, ESSER allocation of the American Rescue Plan. Um, but for some districts, this is this is uh, this is transformate transformative uh, uh, funding, uh, you know, we're talking about between $20,000 uh, per pupil, up, up to $20,000 per pupil. And so the spend down on, on this is going to take some time. And uh, this chart on the right shows that although the money's been appropriated by the state, the, the spending really happens over the next number of fiscal years. Um, in fact, about 60% of the uh, American Re Recovery Plan resources are spent uh, after the current fiscal year. So while the state is uh, adding uh, uh, money to K through 12 budgets, there are significant resources that are coming into the budgets through the, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act. Thank you, Craig. Back. Back to Bob uh, with the, with general fund budget highlights. So quick confession: uh, when when Craig cut out, that was me. I handed. We had a technical issue. We had to trade uh, headsets, and when I gave Craig my headset, then I thought, well, now I need to mute myself, and I muted myself, but I muted Craig because he had my headset. So apologies for that. Problem fixed. Uh, on the gen back to the general fund side, and we're going to wrap up quickly with with some highlights. Um, you know, we talked about around $400 million in ongoing investments um, in lots of one-time spending. Um, just wanted to hit upon um, some of the big buckets of, of one-time uh, one time and ongoing spending here. Um, first, uh, first, the governor proposed a, a major uh, general fund supplemental uh, for fiscal year 2022. Um, that calls for spending a, a net uh, GF of $473 million. Biggest piece, uh, uh, thanks to some uh, Medicaid and Human Services uh, general fund caseload savings um, that we were able, in 22, we were able to support even more spending in this. Uh, those savings helped offset some of the costs. Uh, big, biggest pieces of that, $500 million for the Strategic Outreach and, uh, and Attraction Reserve Fund. That's uh, on top of the billion dollars that was appropriated not long ago uh, for you know business business attraction and outreach efforts for the state. Um, ne next biggest piece, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail when we get to a human services slide, um, behavioral health capacity expansion, $186 million. Of the amount in the supplemental, the big, the big ticket item here is, um, is retention, bonus retention payments for the, for the direct care workforce in this area. Um, we, you know, we, uh, 
you know, one of the challenges in behavioral health is, is, is attracting and retaining uh, uh, quality uh, uh, pr practitioners and, and direct care workers uh, around the state. Um, the reten the, these retention payments would, would try to help, um, you know, uh, uh, help in underserved areas to uh, to make sure we have a, a quality workforce uh, available for for behavioral health. Uh, we'll talk about some other behavioral health expansion capacity expansion efforts um, when we talk about the ongoing investment for human services. Um, also, you know, in addition to the the, the general fund. Uh, departmental supplemental, uh, about $300 million was added to the school aid supplemental um, that, that Craig referenced earlier. Um, I just quickly hit on $200 million in general fund in that school aid supplemental was uh, was targeted for university and community college infrastructure improvements. Um, uh, you know, to address facility and, and uh, infrastructure needs on on university and community college campuses. Another ninety four million dollars uh, in general fund was allocated as well for uh, a Detroit Public School uh, settlement. Big picture, that uh, the these two supplementals, almost seven hundred and seventy three million dollars, um, draw down that GF surplus that we talked about earlier from three point three billion dollars. Um, and, uh, now to about $2.5 billion that will be carried into uh, fiscal year 2023. Um, another piece of the supplemental, and, and just to do a quick review of that American Rescue Plan, th those American Rescue Plan funds to the state, uh, you may all recall that the state fiscal recovery fund under the state fiscal Re recovery fund in the American Rescue Plan, the state received $6.5 billion. Um, about uh, 1.6 billion of that has been committed um, to date, the governor proposes um, $500 million um, in additional uh, in additional state fiscal recovery funds for hero pay for um, uh, for essential work the essential workforce. So that uh, these would be um, you know healthcare workers, food and food and grocery workers, uh, truck drivers, janitors. Um, uh, you know, under under the uh, American Rescue Plan, states are states are allowed to use those dollars for um, uh, effectively uh, bonus pay uh, of up to thirteen dollars per hour for uh, for essential workers. Um, the governor draws five hundred million um, for that purpose. There's a separately, um, uh, and I don't list it here on this slide, uh, uh, thirty million dollars for first responder. Uh, uh, a bonus pay as well, police, fire, EMT, you know, corrections and jail facility. That leaves still about, uh, out of that 6.5, uh, after the governor's allocation, still about $4.3 billion that remains available. The governor has forwarded some some ideas on how she'd like that spent, talking about uh, uh, broadband and workforce development uh, uh, efforts, but uh, uh, she and the legislature will still need to negotiate how that that final 4.3 billion is uh, is allocated. Uh, the next three slides, we'll, we'll talk quickly about some of the ongoing investments in the budget. Um, Health and Human Services was a big uh, uh, was a big recipient of uh, of ongoing funds. Um, the, the the biggest pieces of um, uh, uh, of this for Health and Human Services was a enhancement of dental benefits. Uh, Seventy million dollars in general fund will be allocated to kind of restructure how we deliver medi medi uh, me Medicaid dental benefits. Um, we had a very we have a very successful Healthy Kids Dental Program that helped expand access to uh, to children uh, in Medicaid. That concept of serving uh, uh, providing the benefit through managed care uh, will be expanded to adults as well. Um, and uh, with, with the hopes of increasing access to to quality medical. Uh, uh, of dental care for uh, Medicaid recipients. Again, a, ba a behavioral health capacity expansion that, that does uh, that, that does several things. It increases capacity at um, state uh, state uh, psychiatric facilities around uh, around the state. It also is meant to increase access to community based. Um, beds and private facilities. Those are kind of step down facilities often. Um, both those things are, are meant to try to address sort of a, uh, a backlog of, of access to uh, to that behavioral health care for those in need of, of high, you know, uh, high level uh, behavioral health services. Um, along with the bonus and retention payments, the, the, uh, the, the uh, 
funding proposal all supports support loan repayments to uh, to health uh, to, to behavioral health practitioners. Um, and also, we uh, on the one-time investments, we'll see a new state psychiatric facility, uh, three hundred twenty-five million dollars for a new state psychiatric facility in Southeast Michigan, planned to be a two hundred and sixty-bed facility, um, hopefully completed by twenty twenty-seven, that will replace um, the uh, Hawthorne Center and the Ruther Psychiatric Hospital, um, some of the older facilities in the state. Um, these beds will come online to to replace the uh, the beds in those facilities. Um, uh, uh, Craig mentioned uh, universities um, and the five percent ongoing increase and the five five percent one time increase that the governor was proposing um, in, uh, within the the school uh, the school aid uh, budget. Um, just quickly, I'll talk. In addition to that, which is about a hundred and uh, one hundred forty six million dollar boost. Pretty healthy boost in 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 uh, in uh, reimbursement to uh, grants to operating grants to universities. The governor is also planning to phase in a minimum floor funding for for universities. That that cost is only thirteen million dollars in this budget, um, but uh, the plan is to scale that up so that all universities, um, the state operating grant per full year equated student. Uh, would rise to forty five hundred dollars by by twenty twenty six um the uh, the floor in this uh, uh in this twenty twenty three budget would be thirty five hundred dollars um still just just to reference that chart um and we talked about the general fund issues that we experienced early in this uh this new century um even with these proposals uh Operating funds to state universities is just now then getting above the level that it was at in fiscal year 2023, you know, 20 years ago. Um, so uh, a healthy bump, but um, still, you know, just digging out of uh, of the declines that we saw, um, particularly, uh, you know, through about uh, 2012. Uh, local revenue sharing uh, we wanted to cover as well, and that's the same story, 5%. Um, Ongoing increase, five percent one-time increase for um, uh, for uh, cities, villages, and townships. Uh, the counties also received, uh, in the same way, a five percent ongoing increase and a five percent one-time increase in their county revenue sharing allocations. Um, this the chart, though, again shows much the same story for revenue sharing. Um, the, the the blue sections here are constitutionally obligated. Uh, sales tax revenues that go to, to revenue sharing. The, um, the 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 gray sections represent discretionary statutory revenue sharing. Revenue sharing also was one of the uh, one of the programs that was cut significantly during the bad times. And again, with the with these boosts to for cities, villages, and townships and counties, um, we see revenue sharing not quite getting back to the peak level that it was at you know, more than 20 years ago. So. Uh, uh, a healthy boost, but uh, you know, still digging out of the uh, uh, of the hole uh, you know created earlier in the or earlier in the century. Um, I'll close with with a real quick review of some uh, of some major one-time proposals: economic and workforce development. Um, we're talking about a, 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 a real healthy uh, amount in one-time uh, one-time appropriations for labor and economic opportunity. Um, educational infrastructure collaborations would involve partnerships um, between public universities and community colleges uh, and other entities um, to advance um, uh, the health sciences and medical education in Michigan and also uh, electric vehicle uh, training, teaching, workforce development, uh, $230 million allocated there. Um, regional empowerment program, $200 million. That is uh, That would basically be partnerships between multi-jurisdictional partnerships, local governments, nonprofits um, to tackle um, you know, sort of transformational projects at the local level could be affordable housing, workforce development, small business development projects that have uh, that promise long-term economic benefit. Um, also, significant funding for you know, nature, cultural science grants, and in workforce development efforts in in, in Leo, um, transportation in infrastructure, um, $150 million for critical road and bridge infrastructure, focused on sort of high. Uh, high level critical economic corridors, um, $66 million for 
uh, uh, pump station backups uh, around the state. Um, uh, you address some of the freeway flooding problems we've seen recently, rail grade crossing, electric vehicle rebates up to $2,000 for uh, new electric vehicle purchases, $500 for uh, at home charging equipment um, uh, would be available as one time funding through the governor's budget proposal, funding for environmental challenges. Um, water infrastructure supports to local governments and local communities to help them bring on the expertise needed to manage large uh, water infrastructure projects, have an allocation for matching funds for the new uh, Federal uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act funding. Um, is, is allocated here. High water infrastructure grants to address some of the effects of climate change and, and money for uh, for contaminated site cleanups. All of that one-time funding within the Energy Great Lakes and Environment, uh, Department of Great Energy Great Lakes and Environment. And then statewide sort of uh, one-time funding for technology and facilities. We uh, we have within the judiciary budget uh, a major uh, de uh, a major implementation and development of a, a new ju statewide judicial case management system that will replace sort of fragmented systems in local courts around the state. Uh, 150 million dollar investment in the information technology investment fund to try to modernize um, sort of aging legacy systems in the state um, and to uh, you know address you know high high level. Uh, technology needs. I know cybersecurity is is one area that's discussed um, there as well. And then just uh, seventy million dollars for enterprise wide special maintenance projects where there's been deferred maintenance on some aging state facilities. This this provides money to uh, uh, to begin to sort of address some of those long term needs as well. So um, lots of one time funding on the general fund side. Lots of uh, uh, you know significant ongoing funding as well. We thought we'd wrap up with uh, two more slides. Um, I know we're, hopefully uh, Kyle and uh, John will have some, so we won't steal their lunch from them. They'll still have time to uh, shoot out a couple of questions. But on the general fund side, you know, basically what I'd say is the governor's proposal spends the available, um, spends the available one-time revenue. It allocates the ongoing revenue um, either to the tax relief or tax relief proposals, or to the uh, uh, you know, or to the 410 million dollars that we see here in ongoing investments. Th those major fund balances are are, are largely gone. Then, um, in what you know, going forward into 24, uh, you know, and into 25, we really are back to sort of continuation budgets on the general fund side. Um, we can maintain what's in the budget; it's structurally balanced. Um, but really not a lot of room, um, you know, in 24 or 25. And remember in 25, the retirement proposal, um, the, the, the foregone revenue will grow. That eats up a lot of the revenue growth. And we're back to sort of a, continuation, a continuation budget stage for general fund programs. Um, any, any new enhancements are gonna have to come out of redirecting general fund revenue from somewhere else. A little better picture on the general fund side um, we, we, we still do tap into the, the great majority of the one-time revenue. Um, the, the, the ongoing investments that the governor's proposed are sustainable um, long run, and it gives a little more wiggle room for, for future growth on, on the school aid side of the budget. But um, again, we, we've spoken for the bulk of the, uh, the one-time revenue, and uh, as Craig noted in his section, we added significant um, ongoing investments. Uh, on the school aid side as well. Um, that's that's my conclusion. Craig, did you want to add anything on the school aid side? I think we are done then. Uh, appreciate uh, the attendance today. Again, John and Kyle, thank you for your sponsorship and to Mac as well for, uh, for their support of the webinar. And I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Eric and John and Kyle to, and hopefully we still have time for questions. I, I appreciate everybody's participation. John and Carl, let's go for 15 minutes. Create a hard stop at 1215. Uh, we hope everyone can stick around for a few minutes to hear those questions and answers. Sounds good. I've got it. I'm going to start with um, uh, Robert's budget history 101 slide where you show, kind of show the uh, uh, general fund climbing from 10.8 to 13.3 uh, billion. My question is, um, you know, we were talking before COVID about sort of the structural issues with the state's tax system. Are you at all concerned that 
that what that gain is uh, is built in large part on a huge increase in federal spending with the COVID response packages going all the way back to the Paytech Paycheck Protection Program. Um, I, I guess is that revenue growth real? Is it going to disappear? Are we going to slide backwards? I, I don't think so. That's not what's forecast. Certainly, the the revenue forecasters understand that factor as well. Um, uh, so I, I think we have real revenue growth forecast. I guess I'd take you back to this slide just as a quick response. Um, you know, we saw. I I think this illustrates what you're talking about. Uh, uh, with, with you know with with that stimulus impact that big growth in those gray bars really helped us dr drive a lot of this revenue growth i think what you do see though is we do see the blue and the orange bars kind of looking back to normal <laughs> they're getting they, yeah even though employment is down uh you know the net earnings are sort of returning back to if you draw a line and trend out though those blue bars it looks like we're kind of getting back to normal we do see and the, and the revenue forecast did um, you know, do see absolute revenue growth falling a bit, back a bit in 23 in, in fiscal year 23. But um, I think we still see, even as we wean off of the federal stimulus, um, you know, we're counting on, and it is forecast that we'll we'll see enough restoration and economic growth as well to support ongoing, um, uh, you know, ongoing growth in the budget and in the in the January forecasts really are predicated on that. They understand that we were weaning off. Uh, they, did, they did forecast that economics would, would help us maintain revenue growth going forward. Okay. Yeah, I've got a, uh, I got a question here, Kyle Malin. Uh, the uh, Senate sent to the governor yesterday a, a $2.5 billion tax cut plan. The governor has since called that unsustainable is that something that you guys uh, concur with? It, would that be an unsustainable hit to uh, the state's revenue and uh, the state's budget? So the, we we did have time, and of course this is late breaking, but I, we we did spend a little time uh, yesterday looking at uh, looking at the uh, you know the, the legislative agreement there and the uh, House and Senate Fiscal Agency analyses of this. So um, here's what I would say. We, that this, that the, the, um, the tax proposal would, would, fact, would be heavily general fund, uh, would, would, would affect uh, heavily, heavily on the general fund side. So let, let's look at this, let, let's look at this table. Uh, if, I, if I go and eliminate everything in red here, so if we scrap the governor's tax proposals and replace them with the legislative agreement, if we get rid entirely of the one-time spending proposals in 22 and 23 and the $410 million in ongoing, so basically everything that, that I, I talked about in my section, all of those enhancements, um, and then we replace those tax relief numbers with what I saw in the Senate fiscal and in House fiscal agency analyses of, of the legislative agreement. You, you can get through 2023 without having to cut into the existing budget, um, the, everything that's in black basically uh, on this chart. Um, but uh, you know it, it. But that the revenue decline that you get under the under the legislative uh, agreement eats up all of that balance then, um, because you, you get to about two and a half billion dollars in uh, in revenue reduction uh, with that plan. Most of it, the great majority of it, in the on the general fund side. So in 2024, um, you ha you sort of have your day of reckoning. Um, under my quick. Quick calculations, I saw the need to cut the existing general fund budget by about 1.2 to $1.3 billion to, to make it work and to make it sustainable over time. If you do that, which is you know 10 percent ish type cut to the general fund, then it's sustainable. But it's not sustainable without significant reductions. You know, once you get to 2024, your spending is below the ongoing existing, uh, I'm sorry, your revenue is below the ongoing existing spending for the state and the general fund side. And you need to bring that spending down uh, back to the available revenue. And, and to me, it looked like that was going to be $1.2, $1.3 billion in budget reductions that would be necessitated in fiscal year 2024. Um, 
hopefully that made sense. But yeah. is it sustainable if you either one increase revenue to offset the 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 the, the revenue reduction that you you lose on, under the uh, under the agreement, or you cut the budget, then you can sustain it. But it would require significant adjustments to either spending or new revenue from somewhere else. Uh, if uh, if I could just follow up, uh, James Craig, who's a gubernatorial candidate, suggested yesterday that he'd like to just get rid of the income tax, which is something other political candidates have said. What is the impact uh, to the budget if you got rid of the income tax? If you get rid of the income tax and don't replace the income tax with something different, um, it would be massive. I mean, uh, I, I income tax revenue six seven billion net. Uh, Craig and I are confabbing here. I, I think that I think the net income tax um, on the general fund side is six or seven billion dollars. Craig is trying to look that up right now. I, I mean, that's you know that that's massive. So um, that that takes one of the cornerstones of uh, financing, uh, you know, uh, state spending. High and who gets general fund? Higher education, uh, health and human services, uh, which is, you know, child welfare, uh, Medicaid. Um, and then public safety, so corrections, state police, those are the big utilizers. You, you, would, you would really need to make huge, huge downward adjustments in those budgets, or if what you mean is get rid of the income tax and replace it, uh, then, then you need to talk about what that replacement revenue is and what it comes from. So, so Bob, to follow up on that, there are few taxes capable of raising the amount of revenues that the income tax does. One is the sales and use tax, but our constitution dedicated uh, dedicates those to a number of purposes, school aid fund, state revenue sharing. So that's not really a revenue generator. The property tax, but we are already a very high property tax state. We're just creating, replacing one problem with another. There's a whole lot of other taxes that you can see on our outline of the Michigan tax system on our website, but they're not really revenue generators, not in the way that the income sales or property tax are. So it it does create the hole that Bob described. Quick question for you. Um, one of the things that kind of comes to my mind, and I'm not trying to disparage, this is John Ring, by the way, uh, I'm not trying to disparage government uh, itself, but uh, with the UIA, for example, when a lot of money came through that system, uh, there was an issue with uh, a fraud and abuse. Are you at all concerned that with all this money moving through state government, uh, there's a risk? I mean, are the systems there to to maintain integrity and keep spending in line and, and make sure it's going where it should go? Uh, you know, that's that's always a challenge, and we and we and, and you saw you know uh, problems uh, you know on the on the unemployment insurance side. Um, you know, so. Yeah. Anytime you anytime you get a lot of new revenue, especially if they're for a lot of new purposes uh, that we, uh, you know, uh, new things that we aren't doing right now so that we need to staff up and develop new uh, management and administrative capacity uh, uh, to manage, uh, you know, uh, new things that, that we're not traditionally doing. It raises that risk, uh, you know. Uh, so sure, in a in a way, um, you know those types of things raise risk. Um, you know, I think there were probably some unique things happening on the unemployment insurance side that you know that we're that we're hearing about. So uh, I, it's not um, I, 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 it's it's not you know causing me to lose sleep, but but but. Sure. When when you when you do, especially when there's lots of new money for new things that we haven't um, that we haven't traditionally been part of, um, uh, you, know, the, the, you know those those risks climb a, a bit. Again, let me piggyback on that. So late last year, the Citizens Research Council published a report encouraging the legislature to increase its capacity to provide oversight of the executive branch, and that really speaks to. Your question, John, uh, part of what we could advocate with this is for the legislature to invest in itself, to create the committees, to enhance the ability of the Office of Auditor General, 
to create the capacity to provide the type of oversight so that we, the taxpayers, know that this money is being put to productive use, that there isn't abuse or fraud or, or that type of thing. Um, but part of what happened when the state went through the last decade of the first, uh, the beginning of this century was uh, cuts everywhere throughout state government, including the legislature. Staffing is down what it was 25 years ago. Um, so the ability to provide that oversight is diminished. And, and thus we can see things like this happening. The, the state has to invest in itself as well as investing in all these things that Bob described. I've got a, uh, another question here, Kyle Malin here from MERS. Uh, there is, uh, there's just hypothetically speaking here, if the governor and the legislature decided not to do a tax cut that would create maybe a systemic problem going forward, but instead wanted to do a one-time rebate to all taxpayers in the state, what would be the maximum that you could give as far as a rebate and still be sustainable? Um, just a one-time rebate, and it would be, and it would not, you know, break the bank. We wouldn't go, you know, we would still stay within our budget. Are we, and, and just roughly, I mean, is it a thousand, five hundred, two hundred? What, what would it roughly? What are we roughly looking at? In in, in total dollar allocation, because that's uh, so that that's dependent on what you're willing to sacrifice in the, in these budget proposal. But, but for instance, we, we, uh, I'm, I think you can still see my back to continuation budget slide here. Um, mm -hmm. The governor proposed about $3 billion, a little more than $3 billion in one time spending in fiscal year 22 and 23, the 774 billion and the 2.3 billion in, in, in 23. Um, if you forego that, uh, and don't do any of those things that we uh, that we you know we sort of outline. Well, that's three billion dollars in one-time available resources from the general fund, and you could say we're going to return three billion dollars to the taxpayers, um, mm -hmm. and then you just lose all that one-time spending. Uh, the, you know, going forward, the uh, uh, you know the structural stability would remain, and you know you're back to continuation budget. So um, we have lots of one-time resources. I'd characterize those two numbers as being sort of uh, you know where the governor's proposing spending those resources. If you wanted to do one-time tax relief, you draw on that same revenue, and you you know they'd need to strike a balance between what do we need to spend, what do we want to spend one time, and how much one-time tax relief do we want to. Um, allocate that, that one-time revenue to. Bob, your earlier slide show that there's about $4 billion in federal money that is not allocated yet. Would that in, add to this three, three billion that you, that you mentioned here? We would, um, so that, so one, that's not part of the, the this graphic. Um, and the, I think you're talking about the, uh, uh, the American Relief uh, Rescue Plan uh, items, where was that? Um, uh, so that 4.3 billion that remains um, has to be used within the parameters of the American Rescue Plan. And one way that it cannot be used is to backfill for tax relief. And I think a one-time tax relief drawing on that those federal ARPA dollars probably is out of bounds. So I, I don't think uh, uh, you could use that as a source of one-time tax relief. Mm. I think that's what you were asking, Eric. Yeah. Yes. Do you know roughly how many taxpayers we have in Michigan? Uh, you know, how many taxpayer house? Uh, we, we, you know, we have 10 million population. Mm. Uh, I don't really know how many households we have, to be honest. You got um, what? 4.2 million workers or something like that? Yeah, that sounds, you know, or, or 10 million population. So mm -hmm. if every every individual, you know, if it's $300 per person, that's uh, $3 billion, right? Mm -hmm. I, I have, this is John Rorink with MERS. I have one last question, uh, and it may be out of the scope of the governor's budget proposal, but one of the things I've been talking to with some of our subscribers in the telecom 
industry is the huge amount of money that's being dedicated to the expansion of broadband. Have you guys looked at the total amount that's coming to Michigan and is the state prepared to sort of deal with that and where we're at with that? We we have a blog that uh, that that I published about a month and a half ago that uh, that uh, outlines the amount for broadband, water, transportation, increased transportation funding. Um, I'm I'm too old to have that kind of sharp memory to remember what that what that dollar amount is. I think Craig is is trying to find my blog right now. But it, you know we we're getting this money. This American Rescue Plan money can be used for broadband expansion, and that money in addition that money from the uh, the um, uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the Federal Infrastructure Act, adds to that um, even further. Um, the governor, I know, has uh, has outlined plans to use some of this ARPA money for, to to supplement um, uh, the federal money for for broadband. Uh, I I can I couldn't answer uh, much about the um, you know the industry's preparedness to utilize that. Um, I think when we get a, a large dollar influx available for something, you know, I think the hope would be that lots of lots of money and lots of spending helps draw in um, the workforce and the in the uh, uh, you know in the capacity to do that work. You know, we're also clearly right now in a highly inflationary period. Um, so, you know, uh, sort of a very unique one. Uh, um, you know, given fairly modest inflation over the past past 30 years. So is that a concern? Absolutely. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think the hope would be we have a lot of revenue we can spend on that and on water and on roads. You know, I think I, I, I heard uh, some of the road folks say, you know what, if you have the money for us, we can do it. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I think that money will eventually draw in uh, the workforce and capacity to, you know, to move on that work, even if it comes at, you know, e even if the costs of that work um, are a little higher than, you know, what other what they otherwise might be. All right, so we've reached our our witching hour that we set uh, twelve fifteen. John and Kyle, thank you for participating and these great questions at the end. Bob and Craig, thank you very much. Uh, everyone that's still on, uh, thank you for bearing with us and tuning in today. Uh, have a great weekend. As I said, this session was recorded. It will be on our website, uh, hopefully by about one o'clock or so, if you want to point other people to it. And um, thank you all. Thanks.